We're all in this huge crisis together. It's an opportunity for at least some form of consensus. But our divided, dysfunctional politics get in the way of doing things better, finding solutions. And that's why we're launching Let's Find Common Ground. I'm Ashley Milne-Tight. And I'm Richard Davies. We're bringing together smart, passionate people from different points of view and different backgrounds to shed light, not heat, on the problems we face. That doesn't necessarily mean agreeing, but being in the same room, having a conversation. Episode one, starting over, saving lives and the economy. We're joined by Jared Bernstein and Maya McGuinness. All four of us in our remote studios working from home. Jared was chief economist to former Vice President Joe Biden. He was deeply involved in the White House response and stimulus bill after the last economic shock, the Great Recession that started in 2008. Today, he's a senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Maya McGuinness heads up the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Maya has studied the federal budget and mounting debt for years, and in normal times, she's more of a budget hawk than Jared. But these are not normal times. Jared and Maya, welcome to Let's Find Common Ground. Thank Thank you. you. Let's start with you, Maya. Saving the economy and protecting public health. What's most important right now? So the most important, the number one priority at this time is fighting the pandemic, getting as much testing, doing as much research in terms of medication, ultimately vaccinations, and figuring out how we can minimize the effect of that. Because without tackling the healthcare challenges and the obvious levels of confidence that are related to that, I don't think we'll be able to make nearly enough progress on getting the economy back on track. So Jared, what about the tension between people's health and the economy? Um, I think there's a false tension and a true tension. The false tension is uh, was well described by Maya, the idea that we either have to adequately test and trace or we have an economy capable of recovery. In fact, if we don't do the former, if we don't get our health act together, Um, the economy won't be able to reopen because people won't feel safe engaging in commerce. I think the tension that hasn't been quite identified enough, we're starting to see it in some of these protests that are happening now, is the idea that there's one group of people who are very well insulated from what's going on. And if you're one of these people, and I'm one of them, who clicks into Zoom meetings all day, is busy, is drawing a paycheck, um, you're in a very different group than a a lot of other people who aren't. And there's a tension growing between elites on one side, that maybe maybe isn't the right word, but it's the word that comes to mind, kind of lecturing people on the other side, saying you don't understand the uh, dynamics of uh, the health emergency, so just shelter in place until it's done and we'll tell you when it's uh, okay to come out. That tension is real as well, in my opinion. So so you have some sympathy with, uh, with the protesters? I have some sympathy with the protesters, but there's kind of two groups of protesters. There's people who are genuinely saying, we have to get back to work and we're willing to make a different trade-off than those of us who are doing very well right now. Um, and then there's this other group that's very politically motivated and they're being you know, kind of stirred up by a lot of sort of right-wing um, agitators. And that's, that's different. I, I don't have any sympathy for them. I think we have to be mindful of this potential gulf between those of us who are fine and those of us who can't afford to shelter in place too much longer. For many people, having to shelter in place, meaning not being able to work, not having access to the funds the government is providing, and really having their economic security put into jeopardy or their health security, this could end up being more dangerous for them than the actual virus. And that's from where you see this agitation, which I think is understandable. People saying, might be, it might be good for the overall economy, but if I can't eat, if I can't get the medicine I need, if I can't take care of my kids or I can't juggle the, juggle the job I'm just to have and my kids being at home, it's not working for me. We've had a fair amount of common ground over the need for quarantine, social distancing and other measures to protect people from the health impact of the pandemic. But could that common ground fall apart over this debate 
on exactly how to restart the economy. Yeah, I mean, I think there are different tensions within the restarting debate. And where you stand has a lot to do with where you sit. Polling data has shown that people are actually pretty worried about getting back to life too quickly. Um, people are risk averse, generally speaking. That's just a psychological truth about humans. And when we can't see the enemy, and, and this gets back to the lack of testing, um, we're particularly risk averse. I just think that there's kind of three groups. There's those of us who are doing well and clicking into meetings all day and drawing up a, a paycheck and, you know, oftentimes a pretty fat one. There's those of us who are on the opposite side of that um, line and, and are doing you know very badly. You know, there's 40 million people out there who don't have paid leave. If they miss work, they don't get a paycheck. Um, and they typically have about zero in terms of savings. So they're extremely uninsulated from what's going on right now. And then there's this third group, which are the people who are still working. A lot of those folks are in the healthcare field. Some of them are at the very top of the income scale. You know, surgeons and doctors and other uh, orderlies are at the, at the very low end. So I think for every one of these groups, there's a different set of tensions. And your question about whether how those different groups respond to this gradual reopening that you know has to happen, I think it's going to be different depending on uh, their, their group membership. But all three of those groups depend on something that's not happening, which is adequate testing. And the fact that we've dropped the ball on that is just a, a massive own goal kick. And Maya, what about that soccer analogy from Jared? My son's a goalie, so I hate thinking about own goals. It always puts a pit in my stomach every time I think about own goals. So I do think the issue that's been surfaced, it's one that I was thinking about from the very beginning of this, is how much are we willing to sacrifice in our economy to save how many lives? And it's a very kind of brutal calculation that you sound very heartless for even bringing up. But I would say that is the kind of rigor to these policy discussions that we should always be willing to take. And sometimes I worry in the world of policymaking that politicians try to one up each other on how much money they spend just to show how big their hearts are. Is it possible we could end up spending too much money and then regret that we have this massive pile of debt as a result? The American government spend too much money? That's impossible. No, just kidding. I think that the likelihood at times like this, in my experience, and I've been through <laughs> the the recession formerly known as the Great Recession, which at this point isn't looking uh, as horrible as it used to. Um, and I was in the thick of it back then, working for the Obama administration. I've been through uh, a number of recessions. I worry that we'll do too little. The other thing I worry about that pushes the other way is not that we won't spend enough money, but that we'll get too little bang for buck in the money that we do spend. So that we'll spend it in ways that are politically motivated, but economically inefficient. Maya, you lead the group Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. You're very concerned about spending and debt. How do you see this question? I think there are two big risks here. The first risk is that we will not spend enough or that we will stop putting in measures to stabilize the, the economy prematurely because of concerns about debt. And right now, the debt is growing at an astronomical level. As somebody who worries about the debt professionally, it gives me heartburn nonstop. But I need to be really clear, this is exactly the moment that borrowing was made for. So I'm very worried that we will stop spending, we'll spend too little. Um, but I am also worried, and this is where Jared and I probably differ more, I am very worried that once we get through this, we will have a massive mountain of debt. And that's when the politicians will say, we can't do anything about it. It is easier to borrow money than to pay for things. Politicians may seem like they're arguing, but when they end up just saying we're going to give lots of unpaid for tax cuts and spending increases and we've compromised, that's a compromise that just means we're borrowing trillions of dollars. Where the compromises are really tough is when they have to bring the debt back down when the economy is healthy. The past expansion, which was a record long expansion since the president's been in office, he signed into law $4.7 trillion in new borrowing during a very strong economic expansion. 
So I'm worried that's what we'll see on the other side of this as well, so that we might borrow too little now because of concerns about the debt, but that we won't do anything about the debt when the economy is strong again. Um, the problem, and I'm agreeing with Maya here, the problem is not that we're doing too much now, it's that we did, quote, too much earlier. When your economy is closing in on full employment, which was the case before this crisis, that's when you want your fiscal gap, meaning the difference between what you collect and what you spend, to start closing. And that wasn't the case. In fact, it was opening wider, the gap between what we collect and what we spend. So we cut taxes uh, uh, to the tune of $2 trillion. That's the Trump tax cuts, very much tilted towards the high end. And, and frankly, those folks were doing really well already, so they didn't need more goodies. But we also put a bunch of spending on the deficit. So before we got into this, when the economy was booming, historically, booming economies have brought in tons of revenue. This economy wasn't doing that. And what just drove me nuts and continues to do so is people who voted for those tax cuts getting all wound up about the, the, the budget deficit, especially at a time where even Maya agrees, and Maya's been, as she said, you know, very hawkish on, on these issues, um, that we should be doing you know, what we need to do in terms of borrowing and spending right now to temporarily offset the contraction. It's not the temporary stuff that gets you into fiscal trouble. It's the permanent stuff. So, Maya, are both parties to blame? What we've seen in the past years was a huge unpaid for tax cut. It did a lot of damage, followed by two huge unpaid for spending increases that also did a lot of damage. I'm, a, I'm an independent. I don't, I don't like that we look at the world with two sides. But you will always have people who want smaller government. You will always have people who want bigger government. We will have to compromise because this is a country filled with both. And the compromise shouldn't be, we just won't pay for anything. We're so I, dis I disagree. We found something to disagree on. <laughs> I think it's just like really unsubstantiated to say that there are people who want smaller government. There are lots of people walking around mouthing their support for smaller government, but they continue to sign every single bill that you just criticized. The problem is that there's a bunch of rhetoric perhaps on both sides. I hear it more on the right, but perhaps it's on both sides. There's a bunch of rhetoric about how, you know, I want small government, but it's the old St. Augustine thing, you know, give me fiscal rectitude, but not yet, not today, not on this bill. One, it's not so much that I want small government. I, I can see arguments from both sides. I want paid for government. I don't want my kids to have to pay for my government. The way you get small government, if that's what you want, it's not by cutting taxes. It's by cutting spending. Because on the right, this, this pretending you get there by cutting taxes isn't true. But on this left side, oftentimes pretending you can pay for everything just by taxes on millionaires and billionaires also isn't sufficient for the kinds of big spending programs we're hearing. So we need to be more honest about all of the policies that people are saying in their political talking points. Well, I've written, I've written extensive articles on uh, all of the points you just made, including um, emphasizing that we can't achieve the progressive agenda simply uh, on the top 1%, that taxes have to uh, increase more broadly on uh, more groups of people. You're listening to Let's Find Common Ground. I'm Ashley. I'm Richard. More with Jared Bernstein and Maya McGuinness coming up. Our podcasts are brought to you by Common Ground Committee. Its public events inspire citizens and leaders to make progress on issues through civil public discourse. Bringing light, not heat, to public discourse. That's our motto. We put forums together where we bring panelists from opposite sides of, of a tough issue. Please welcome Secretary Condoleezza Rice. Please welcome Secretary John Kerry. Chris Wallace. Maggie Haberman. Michael Steele. Donna Brazil. We have to get back to a place, I think, in society where we can foster civility in our conversation. We need a new vocabulary to talk about race. I agree 100% with Donna in terms of moving back into that space where we have a civil conversation. But folks, it's got to start in a neighborhood. It's got to start in a community. It's got to start most especially in a home. Watch full events online at commongroundcommittee.org 
or on our Common Ground Committee YouTube channel. Now back to Jared Bernstein and Maya McGuinness. When we talk about a lot of this stuff, even though the numbers are huge, there's been this deficit for a, quite a while, it's really difficult for everyday people to get their heads around this. Like it's difficult for me to get my head around this. And I was a business reporter for a long time because it's so abstract. So how do you and your kids are going to be, you know, some of them are graduating really soon. They're going to be coming into this world where we're trying to pay all this off. Talk a little bit about who will be most affected by this and how we make this matter to them by making them understand exactly what is at stake. Well, just when you mentioned my kids, boy, do my kids wish I would talk about something other than the deficit. <laughs> boy, would they like that. I wrote a quick story, but when my daughter was quite young, I think it was about five, my husband went to her class and explained what his job was. And then I said, ah, oh, Annika, would you like me to come to school and talk about the deficit? And without missing a beat, my daughter goes, oh, sorry, no, it's illegal. So that's how much my kids care about this issue. Trillions mean nothing. This is what I do for a living. And trillions mean nothing to me. Billions mean nothing to me. Millions barely mean anything to me. Like these numbers are way too abstract. And the deficit, to quote a great economist, Charlie Schultz, is more like the termites in the basement in that the effect it has is eating away at the foundation of the economy, not something you can see like spiraling healthcare costs or job loss or saving for retirement or student debt. The problem with the deficit is that it can that it can have a negative effect either gradually by having slow, gradual effects on our economy, on economic growth, on standard of living, on our dependency on foreign countries. Again, we borrow 40% of the money to finance our deficit annually from other countries. And those are countries that we are not necessarily aligned with. So there's a lot of vulnerabilities that come with it, or it could lead to a lot of spiky, quick problems. We're leaving them with very little flexibility to chart their own course because we've pre-committed so much in promises and in interest that we will owe on the debt. So I see that pretty differently. I think of this very much in terms of good debt and bad debt. And I worry just as much about leaving my children a disinvested economy where we've failed to invest in the kind of public goods, meaning government funded goods and services that will make this country far less functional, productive, welcoming to them as they grow up. I've got a senior in high school who's going to miss her graduation because in part, because I mean, the, the, the virus is not Donald Trump's fault, but the delayed reaction to it, the lack of attention to the warnings that were here, the disinvestment in our healthcare community. This is a dysfunctional government lack of investment that's going to make the world a lot worse for my and everybody else's kids. Charlie Schultz is wrong. The deficit doesn't eat away at the economy like termites if it's being invested in things that are really important and useful for the future, in, in providing um, people in, um, in, in neighborhoods that are fraught with poverty and inequality with the kinds of upward mobility and opportunity that they've always lacked, in part because of racial discrimination. Those are really good, smart investments that no private firm will ever make. So I don't really like this idea of saying there's this big chunk of money out there that's going to screw the future, when in fact, we're undermining the future by not uh, adequately investing in, in it today. Reopening the economy, and I don't know whether both of you will find common ground or, or disagree, are there certain sectors, Jared, that should open sooner rather than later? And are there others where perhaps they do need to be shut down for quite a long time? I don't know that there are obvious sectors, um, even the restaurant and the hotel sector, which are the most obvious, could potentially be gradually reopened. And in fact, some of that discussion is, is ongoing. It won't look like uh, the restaurants that you're used to and tables will be separated and you may have to have your temperature taken on the way in. There's all kinds of wrinkles that could go on as we go. I like the way Andrew Cuomo says, if we're not going to go from red to green, we're going to go through yellow. We will probably have sporting events before you know it. 
um, but they'll just be on uh, TV. There won't be fans in the stands. I happen to have a college student uh, home. She's a sophomore at college. I have a senior who's supposed to go to college. So I'm very focused on getting these kids back out of the house. Um, I'm going to presume they're not going to listen to this. And um, I think colleges are an interesting case because I think, again, they're, they they may be able to open conditional on the kinds of testing and tracing we've talked about earlier. They may be able to open, but not for everybody to come back, not for everybody to come back at once. People who live far away may have a tougher time coming back because they'd have to relocate very quickly. Um, so I think there's this weird average of social distancing and commerce that we're going to be experiencing. We've never done anything about this like it before, so it's a little hard to describe. Do you think there's greater urgency, Maya, in getting uh, manufacturers back, people who make stuff? I mean, I think if what you're talking about is supply chains, one of the things that we've many people are concerned about, and I put myself in this camp, is realizing that the interconnectedness of a global economy has left us vulnerable in a lot of places. When you are uh, dependent on other countries who are also going through a pandemic for your masks or your ventilators or inputs into your medications. That's a vulnerability I think we're going to rethink in a lot of ways. If you're talking about domestically where we have been hardest hit, I think construction and manufacturing probably won't be the hardest hit of all the sectors. I think the real question will be some of the sectors that go through massive disruption and don't return to the way they were before. Such as? Well, I mean, something I've been thinking about today because I have a friend who runs a gym, but I don't know that small gyms are ever going back to where they were. And, you know, all the things that people are doing online that they might like better, I don't think I'm flying across the country for three-hour meetings the way I used to. And it turns out these video conferences are pretty effective. Um, I am going to a restaurant when I can because I really... I enjoy that and that that you know I feel like I'll be much more comfortable doing that but I think there'll be more thinking about technology and education like Jared I have kids at home I have an 8th grader and a 10th grader and watching them learn online some things are working really well and some things are terrible and the social isolation is not not healthy for them and it's not healthy for us <laughs> their parents but I do think watching the scale that you can have of brilliant professors who can reach hundreds or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of students. And we've always known this to be true, but we've, we've resisted those changes. Those things will be sped up. And so I guess I look at this moment as there are some industries that have benefited, a lot of technology, for instance, because it's created a connectivity that we could not have gotten through this without. And we've seen how useful it's been. Some that have been not very affected at all, some that have been harmed, but will bounce back really quickly, um, and some that will be changed forever. Jared, what about the impact on trade and whether the pandemic could lead to a setback for globalization and supply chains that rely on products made in different countries? Um, I think any card carrying economist will argue in favor of increased trade flows because it increases the supply of goods and has favorable price effects. Um, but there's uh, been a, a real exposing of the downside risks of, uh, of supply chains. And we, we saw that in, in Trump's trade war as well. You know, I remain a great opponent of the trade war, but we have to recognize that when those chains are threatened, it is tough for, it's very tough for commerce. So if we were to produce more here that we're currently importing from abroad, that, that would actually be favorable in lots of ways uh, for American growth. But it would also be good for jobs because those blue collar jobs uh, pay uh, higher than average. And uh, I think that would be a plus. And what about the government and the huge role it plays in the economy? I hope that government is seriously changed and reformed after this. But I think that this crisis has exposed a set of really intense vulnerabilities uh, in our federal sector in particular. And boy, if we don't learn what I believe are the right lessons and come out of this uh, trying to improve that functionality, trying to build the insulation that we lack in key areas, um, then you know we're going to be back here sooner than we want, and it will be our own fault. Maya, Jared just mentioned that 
that the government will need reforming, that, that some government institutions have performed much better than others. What's your view on that? Well, I'm not sure if Jared and I would agree on what the solution should be, but we certainly agree that a lot of problems have been surfaced. Um, and our group, the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, has also launched a different project called Fix Us in the past year because we've been really aware of how division and dysfunction in government has stood in the way of making any progress on hard policy issues from our perspective dealing with national debt, but I think that applies to many policy issues. Can we make this an opportunity for American reset? So instead of coming out of this more broken, could we come out more unified and more functioning? I think looking at leadership has been something that we've all been thinking a lot about as we've looked at the president and the governors and then finding leadership and and real security from the frontline people in our economy, you know, from the doctors to the supermarket workers. I also think issues of federalism are going to be rethought and rediscussed massively as we've seen how different states are handling this. And a final thing is, I think about the resilience that government needs to promote and that there are certain things we now know you have to have set up for emergency and it's food supply and it's medical supply and it's housing and it's communication and it's security and how we're going to strengthen all those institutions. We have lost trust in our leaders. We've lost trust in our institutions. We've lost trust in each other due to a massive amount of polarization and failure in a lot of ways. And how we become strong enough to come together and work on those issues, I think, will be the real sign of whether this country remains the remarkable kind of in the remarkable position it's been as a nation going forward for the coming decades. I think it's a huge issue. That's Maya McGuinness with Jared Bernstein on Let's Find Common Ground. These podcasts are a production of Common Ground Committee. Find out more about our work and our mission at commongroundcommittee.org. Subscribe to Let's Find Common Ground wherever you get your podcasts. And podcast reviews help listeners find us. Miranda Schaefer is the producer and editor of Let's Find Common Ground. We get production and research help from Eric Olson and Donna Vislaki of the Common Ground Committee. Thanks for listening.